All right. I got a call at 8.15 this morning. Uh, and uh, the Bible does say you must be instant in season and out of season. It was out of season, but fortunately, and I'll recommend this, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary has all kinds of free courses you can take on every subject you can imagine. Uh, I don't know why. I started uh, putting them up, and you know they give you a little certificate after each one, and I got them all on my wall downstairs. Not, nobody sees it. So you don't need to go down and look at it. But the latest one had to do with leadership. And it had to do with various leaders in the Bible, uh, one of which is Nehemiah. So I'd like you to turn to uh, Nehemiah uh, this morning. And we'll be going through chapter 1. Teacher on this particular course is very dynamic. As a leader, he says that if you have led or you think you've led, and you haven't left any leaders behind you, and you haven't been a good leader. Uh, Jesus spent his time with his 12 disciples in order to teach them how to lead. And as we read in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, uh, they did just that. Uh, Nehemiah also did. And... uh, And there's one thing that made it all possible. Uh, Today, I cannot change your mind. My words will not do it. Uh, I can read God's word, and that doesn't necessarily change your mind either. Uh, What changes your mind is the Holy Spirit and whether or not you're willing to listen to the Holy Spirit, whether or not you're... uh, able to see yourself in it. A lot of times what we do is we, we look at a passage and we say, I know who should have heard this. You know, it might be a family member, it might be somebody we work with or whatever, but the point is, I wish they had been here. Well, uh, I, I guess in, you know, in all of the teaching that I've done, you know, whether it was started out in children's church, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, I did that for 30 years. And toward the end of that, I was in Fort Wayne, and I also did uh, uh, Awana. Uh, And here, I was here one week, and uh, Jim Mates, who was the acting uh, pastor at that time, you know, and in our transition mode, we hadn't had Pastor Ken here yet, said, uh, I don't have time to, to be preaching on Sunday, so I want you to teach the adult Sunday school class. So I had been doing that also in Fort Wayne, and so... Uh, being in the Bible all the time helps you. So being in Nehemiah Nehemiah chapter 1 and and following all day yesterday helped me. So Pastor Ken says, you have a message? I said, well, no, but there is something I've been studying. So that's why we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 1. So uh, pray with me. Uh, You know, I really appreciated uh, the songs this morning. Uh, they were all gospel related, and uh, the ones that that weren't were an application to our own lives, like it is well with my soul, because there are things that God wants us to do. Uh, he tells us what's right, and all those commandments in the Old Testament that we say, oh, that's Old Testament, we don't have to believe that anymore. We're in the age of grace. We can do whatever we want. Ah. Um, God is describing himself, and he's describing who he created in the beginning. Adam and Eve were created to be like him. They were created in the image of God. And we are also. So the question is, what are we listening to? And even though we listen, quite often we just say, I'd rather do my own thing. So there's a little change in there that has to take place. And it was like, it is well with my soul. Uh, You know what came before that? It was confession. So let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we know that we're not perfect. None of us is. Lord, I pray that as we go through this lesson, we don't think about other people, but we would think about ourselves. That we would realize how much uh, we need 
uh, to confess, we might realize how much you took upon yourself as you died for our sins, for each one of our sins, for all of our sins. You have that promise for sin from the very beginning to the end of our lives. Lord, we, we sin because we don't know everything. We don't know you in every way, the way we should. The more we study the Bible, the more, the more we know what you're like and the more we know what you would like us to be like. So Lord, I, I just pray that you would uh, just work in us today, move in our hearts, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> so if we start out in uh, Nehemiah uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, I'm sorry, and it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Sushan the citadel. And I'll stop there for a second. All right, Nehemiah uh, was one of those Israelites that was captured uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. And here he is in Sushan. He was in the citadel. He was in the capital city. Uh, and uh, so it was in the 20th year uh, that I was in Sushan, the citadel. I didn't look up to find out uh, the 20th year of what, but the point was that he was there. Now, we know that it's pretty close to the end of the captivity because we know what he got involved in later, uh, which we're not going to get involved in today. But, but the point is that, that here was a man, uh, an Israelite, who evidently was very smart. He was uh, very useful, and so consequently the king put him in a position where he was able to uh, be of some influence for the king, as we will as we will read. So in and in uh, verse two, it said that Hanani, one of my brethren, came from men from Judah, and I asked them uh, concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity uh, and concerning Jerusalem. So he wanted to know what's happening back home. There's, there's a big desert in between the two. I mean, you can't go through the desert, so you got to go up and around, you know, the Fertile Crescent, in order to have uh, any information come or go in the other direction as well. And uh, we've seen... Uh, descriptions of that elsewhere in the scripture where there's robbers and there's uh, uh, animals that, uh, that like flesh, uh, serpents. And so it's a dangerous journey, but they made it. So a group of them obviously came. And so they were men from uh, Jerusalem. And he wants to know what's going on. Uh, Marianne and I were in Fort Wayne for five years. And we wanted to know what's going on. And uh, Janet Thorner at that time was always sending out these, uh, these little, uh, this is what, gone, what, what went on in the week. They were called Heidi Hoes. And so we'd read that and we'd find out, you know, what's going on here and there. And it, uh, you know, it was important for us to keep in touch with the people that we knew here. Because we'd been here, uh, you know, quite a few years uh, before uh, ITT decided to, to send us to uh, Fort Wayne. Right, verse 3. Uh, here comes the bad news. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Well, that's not good news at all because, you know, the way the cities are built back then, uh, you know, there wasn't, they didn't have bombs, uh, you know, I don't, I don't recall anything about catapults or things like that except in movies. Uh, but, but the point is that unless you had a strong wall and unless you had a strong gate, uh, people wouldn't be able to get in. And so what they would have to do is something like build a ramp, you know, up to the top of the, the, uh, the wall or... Uh, they would have to 
you know, try to break in the gate. And, and in those cases, what they had is special fortifications so that they could pour oil on them, I suppose, and then light the fire. And that's the only protection you had. Uh, now, they knew uh, that when Joshua came into Jericho, uh, how did they break the walls down? Yep. Seven times around, they prayed, and everybody was making fun of them and everything like that. What do you think you're going to do by walking around our, our, our walls? It's God that does that. And so some of our songs that we sang this morning was how God is the one that's powerful. He was the one who created everything. And he can break down what he wants to break down. You know, he can, done it, he can do it with his word. That's all he has to do is just say. And the walls uh, in Jericho did fall down. Well, in this particular case, it was Nebuchadnezzar that broke the walls down because God allowed him to break the walls down because Judah, along with Israel to the north, had been worshiping false gods. Now, Judah had a few good kings who tried to stop that. But for one man or a few people to decide that they were going to Worship God and God alone does not mean that everybody does. I, I would like to put in a plug for Pastor Ken when he has a vision of doing something. You know, everybody say, yeah, yeah, we'll do it and we'll pray for you. And yet, quite often, you know, we don't become involved in it. Uh, when you have a leader as a pastor is supposed to be, and we recognize a pastor is supposed to be, and the, and the church rises and falls on the leadership. If we don't support our pastor, then what happens is what happened to Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar came in, and he just uh, pulled everybody out. And it was the rich people that he pulled out. Why? Well, we read, you know, in other parts of Scripture, is that the rich people were taking advantage of the poor people. We were just reading uh, this morning in Sunday school about Amos and how the poor people were supposed to be able to glean in the fields. You were supposed to leave the corners of the fields uh, available for them to take. But instead, what they were doing uh, in Amos's time was they were taxing the poor people. And if the poor people needed a loan, what, you were supposed to, what they did is they said, here, I'll give you my... My cloak, you know, for a, for a short-term loan. And Moses said, you're supposed to give it back to them at, at uh, dusk. They didn't do that. They kept it. And they even used it as rugs while they worshipped uh, false gods. They took advantage of the poor. And so what uh, God allowed uh, Assyria and Babylon to do is they took all the rich people. Because they presumed that the rich people uh, were the ones who were taking advantage of the poor people. And so what you're la left with is a bunch of poor people back in, uh, back in Judah, in this particular case, and in, in Jerusalem. And these people came and they said, it's not, we're not only poor, but uh, you know, we're, in, we're in really bad shape. Jerusalem itself is broken down. The walls are broken down. The gates are, are, are destroyed. Now you read on in Nehemiah and you find out how his leadership, he was able to rebuild everything. He rebuilt the walls in 55 days, the walls of Jerusalem. That's impossible by yourself. But he was able to organize everybody. He was a good leader. So let's see how this starts. In verse uh, 4, here's how it starts. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, a pastor will tell us, you know, when we have something, he says, uh, uh, something on a calendar, you know, it's just stuff on a calendar. But it's not supposed to be just stuff on a calendar. It's supposed to be stuff that we pray for. And the more people that are praying, uh, the, the more... Uh, God is able to understand that these people really do care. 
uh, heard these things, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Uh, we look at fasting, and I remember when, I, when Mike Grubbs, uh, you know, was, was telling me about, you know, disciplines in a, in, a, in a Christian's life, and I looked at, you know, at fasting. And uh, I was thinking, wait a minute, I just came out of Catholicism, and, and for them, you know, you earn God's favor by fa- fasting. It's not that at all. It's just like, God, my life does not mean anything if you don't move. And if it doesn't mean anything, you know, it's like the, like the widow uh, of Zarephath, was it, that says, oh, I only got you know, a little bit of flour and oil left, but so I might as well fix it for you, and my son and I will just die because we won't have anything to eat. I mean, if everything is really that bad, you're willing to die. You're willing to not eat. But when that happens, when God sees that you're, essentially you're willing to give up your own life as he, in the future, in this particular case, was willing to give up his life, then God hears these things. Uh, so I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. And it wasn't just five minutes. It wasn't just a short time. It was a lot of prayer. Uh, I heard, heard one time about a fellow who uh, was asked to pray you know, a church, you know, he stood up and, and he said, and Lord, we continue to pray. He'd been praying before. He'd been praying during. And when he had a chance to pray, it was just continuing to pray. But when you're just continuing to pray, you don't have to get up and tell everybody everything you know. Now, what we're doing is we're going to be reading down through, and we're going to find out that Nehemiah thought a lot about God. But that's not a public prayer. You know, when we've been praying all the time, we say, God, you know what we've been praying for? You know what we've been fasting for? You know what we've been, we've been just uh, laying our lives down in front of you? And it's, you know, it's serious prayer. And then you just say, Lord, you know what our problem is. We can't do anything. Just think of uh, you know, the last song you know, that we sang. I'm talking about uh, here. This man was a captain of a of a boat that that carried slaves over from from Africa, and he knew it was wrong. And he prayed that God would would forgive him. He knew that he sinned not just a little bit, but he sinned a lot. So let's not talk about somebody else. Do we recognize sin in our own lives? Uh, I mentioned quite often that there's three things that God cares about. He cares about our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so, how much time do we really spend with God? How much of our talents are we really using for God's glory? And how much of our treasure are we putting where our mouth is? I... Uh, you know, it's not something I, it, it's not a badge of, of righteousness or anything like that. But when, uh, when I got saved, I, I thought, well, I want to contribute toward what, what the church is doing. I, I didn't get my name on a brick. You know, I didn't get it on a you know, stained glass window or anything like that. It wasn't like I wanted recognition for something like that. But when you get to the point where you say, I, I just want to be, I just want my part of my treasure to go to you. I know when the, uh, I added things up one time, and I found out that Israelites tithe, okay, 10%. They had a temple tax. I forget what that was. And they gave to the poor. And I don't know, there were several things in there. I added them all up, and they came to about 40% they gave. Now, I understand that today, what we do is we we pay taxes, and the state, is supposed to be doing those things that we did, taking care of the older people, you know, taking care of orphans, uh, taking care of the homeless. The state is supposed to do that. And if they don't do that, we get mad at the state. But really, you know, originally, in Bible times, it was our responsibility to do that. 
And so they, when they willingly did that, God blessed them. God says, you do these things. You take care of the poor, the widows, and the homeless. And you get to enjoy the rest. So if you gave 40%, you got to enjoy the 60%. You know, instead of being, well, you know, am I, am I really giving enough or anything? You know, it's not a matter of obligation. It's not a matter of what you have to do. It, it, you know, it, it, as if somebody thought, well, I have to earn my way into heaven. It's not that at all. It's a, it's a voluntary thing. So here, voluntarily, you know, he was giving his time. And he was giving up, you know, food. You know, th- for many days he did this. And uh, in verse 5, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. You know, you just look at that right there. And, you know, we, we sang a couple songs that... that it was all about God's glory and about God's creation and how God made things that, that there's no way that, that we can enjoy what we enjoy with, unless God had, had uh, provided it or provided even the intellect and somebody to know how to use certain things uh, you know, to, that would benefit our life, that would allow us to worship God even more. And so, great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. And so he has a covenant. So it's not just here are rules that describe God's character, that God's love, that God's justice. You know, all of these rules, you know, had to do with you want to be like God? Follow these rules. God wants you to be like him. God gives you everything you need. He gives you his word. I mean, all of this is a description of God. Um, I know one of the courses that I took from Dallas Theological was you ought to be able to read Jesus Christ into each one of these. No matter where you are, you know, you're going to find out not just the character of God, but the character of Jesus Christ. He was giving. He gave his life. Temporarily, you can say, well, it was just temporary. You know, he knew he was going to go back to heaven. Try it someday. I, I've never tried it. Uh, go down and live underneath the Memorial Bridge for a while. Uh, you know, one of these abandoned houses you know, in Rochester where people, uh, people are the only place they can get, you know, out of the cold or out of the rain. Uh, we've never done that. We live in a nice, affluent neighborhood over near RIT. Uh, people like it there. We know that because it seems like every day the traffic gets more and more going up and down East River Road. Everybody wants to live there. We live there. You know, it's, it's nice. Uh, I got a really nice guy taking care of my lawn. Uh, thank you, Chad. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Uh, He's got to come over there, I think, more than once a week to be able to keep up with the grass these days. But the point is, we live in luxury. We have air conditioning. We have heating. And it's all there because of God. Great and awesome God. Now, the point is that he has a covenant. If you follow me, if you worship me, I will bless you. Who doesn't want God's blessing? Every one of us does. And all we've got to do is just follow God's plan, not our own. Not some lawyer's plan that we ran into recently. Uh, maybe not even somebody that uh, says, oh, hey, give all your money to me. I'll, I'll give you a little slip of paper that says you own some gold. Uh, you want to keep the gold yourself? Or are you going to have to make a special little vault in a basement floor with a combination lock on it. So I'll never tell until they hold the gun to your wife's head and said, are you sure you're not going to tell me of the combination? There's no way to keep what belongs to the world. We may have it for a while. We may have it to use. Uh, as Pastor says, you know, it's what does God want me to do with his money? In other words, it's got to be his purpose. 
uh, or his treasure, or I have a Bible, do I read it? Do I keep up with it? I mean, that's why God gave it to me. Great and awesome God who keeps a covenant, and that covenant is a covenant of mercy, and we sang about that this morning, you know, about how God uh, died on the cross for us. He was put in a grave for three days so that the Romans would know, yeah, he's really dead. But they couldn't keep him there. I want to point out, by the way, if you look in your Bible, they didn't open the tomb to let Jesus out. He was gone, and they they opened a tomb so they could see that the tomb was empty. Read your Bible carefully. You're going to see that. Just like he came in when they were in the upper room, and all of a sudden he showed up in the middle of them, and all of a sudden he left. I don't know what we're going to be like when we get to heaven. It could be that... (laughs) You know, there'll be doors, but we don't care. We'll just walk right through them. Um, Steve's out there. You know, and Steve, Steve has studied enough uh, nuclear physics to know that there's a lot of space in between all the elements of, your, of each atom. And there's no reason why, you know, things can't go through each other. But not yet. Okay, have mercy on those who love you and observe your commandments. Now, here he gets into his prayer. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night. So, he wants, you know, he's been praying And part of God's covenant says that if you pray and you seek me, you shall find me. He's not hard to find. So before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants. And he's talking about these that that have come from from Israel, the ones that care, the ones that are crying about the state of of Jerusalem. But here's the important thing. Not only do they care about it and they're your servants, but they confess the sins of the children of Israel. Yeah, we know about the sins of Israel, don't we? We know about the sins in Washington, D.C. and and maybe in Rochester, New York, uh, uh, or maybe in our local police forces or whatever. We know about their sins, which we have sinned against you. We were part of it. Both my father's house and I have sinned. So it's not just we're going to pray for other people's sins. We're going to pray for our sins. You need to look into your own lives. You need to compare it with the Word of God and you need need to say where am I? Am I really that righteous as much as I think I am? I need to confess my own sins before God. And then going on to verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you. He's taking, taking some responsibility for the fact that of, of what we're going to be reading here lately. We have a silent majority, and I believe it is. Uh, it's a minority of people who are really uh, the ones who have benefited from all the money that's flowing around. If you want to know where the, where the problems are, follow the money. We have acted very corruptly against you, have not kept the commandments and the statutes, nor the ordinances which you command your servant Moses. I really thank God for the, uh, you know, even though a lot of Jews don't uh, believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, they believe in the law of God, and they try to teach uh, their children accordingly. And where New York State said that uh, they're going to have to do things the state way, uh, they said we will not. You know, over our dead bodies, are we going to do that? And the, uh, and the courts did agree with them. So, and the same thing with, uh, with compass care. <coughs> no, I'm sorry. <coughs> did that wrong, didn't I? Okay, uh, we have acted very corruptly against you and not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you command your servant Moses. So he's talking about Old Testament times here. But, like I say, Old Testament times are the same things that we need to do today. And 
Jesus Christ, when he preached, he preached how many of those are applicable today. Maybe you haven't murdered somebody, but you felt like it. Or maybe you haven't committed adultery, but you wished you could have. Uh, you know, it's in, whatever is in the mind is what matters. And so the mind is the important thing. Um, verse 8, remember, I pray, the word that you command your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. So that's one of God's promises. He promised, if you follow me, I will bless you. If you don't follow me, I will scatter you among the nations. Now, he has a purpose for this. It's not that he's throwing them away, but he's saying, you, want, you don't want to, you want to live like the people around you that I told you not to associate with, where you're going to see how bad they are. And when you see how bad they are, you're going to want to come back here and you're going to want to serve me. If you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations in verse 9. But, I love this, some of these but words are really nice. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and I will bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Did you just come back to God? And he says, he will bring us back. So they had a promise that Jerusalem would be restored because he said, you know, this is my country. You are my people. This is Jerusalem, the place for the temple. This is where you need to worship me. And they were commanded to go there, have a pilgrimage three times a year. And uh, for the time that uh, Israel had, had split from from Judah, uh, we even talked about this in Sunday school, uh, all of a sudden there was a thing, well, we don't want our people in Israel to have to go down to Judah to go to Jerusalem. So we're going we're gonna to have a couple of places up here. You know, Bethel and, and Dan, they put, a, they put a golden calf. And it comes up, why a golden calf? Well, it was the same thing when Moses came off the mountain. They had a golden calf. So where did that go back to? Dave Havens, where did that go back to? Egypt. You know, amazing how those old sins keep cropping up. So, you know, let your ear be attentive, verse 11. Oh, wait a minute, we, we uh, skip. Verse 10, verse 10. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. This, this could be a song we could sing, and we, I'm sure we sang a song this morning that was parallel to that. It's God's strong hand that controls everything. We've read the end of the book, and we know who wins. So verse 11, Lord, I pray. Okay, he prays now, but remember what he'd gone through before. God, you are the one that is strong as everything. You are the one that created us for your purposes. Lord, we have sinned. And yes, we deserve to be where we are, but Lord, we know that if we turn back to you, that you will restore us. So Lord, I pray, uh, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant in other words, this is Nehemiah, prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. This man being the king, because he's, here he is, he's praying before the king. And you don't just go up to the king and tell him what you want. But he says, for I was the king's cupbearer. I meant to bring a cup with me. And we have this idea that the reason why he's a cupbearer is he could find out if there was poison in something uh, you know, before, uh, you know, so that he would die before the king would have it. No. Uh, it turns out that historically, uh, I mean, in, in many other uh, places in the Bible, it, the cupbearer was the son or was the, was the person who was like second in command, the person who was with the king all the time, his, his confidant. And yet there was still this, this realization that if I come up before the king, 
uh, like an Esther, you know, unless he points his staff toward me, then I, you know, somebody could separate my head. Um, so here he was, but he was still concerned. So grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the king, for I was the king's cupbearer. You know, and it goes on from then, and you get to you get to read how God moved. It wasn't just Nehemiah's words. It was the fact that God moved, not just in Nehemiah's heart to give him the words to say, but he moved in the heart of the king in order to be able to give uh, Nehemiah uh, his uh, permissions to go, his uh, provisions to be able to keep him there, be able to keep him alive during this trip, and also his protection you know, from other people. So he asked for those things. He knew what he needed to do. So it's uh, this is uh, just chapter one, and you find out through the rest of Nehemiah that when he needed something, I want you to know his first response was to pray. And it was prayer that was, was heartfelt. It was recognizing, Lord, I cannot do this myself. I cannot proceed in life without you pointing the way to, for me. He was in a precarious situation there before the king who had all power to either listen or to essentially kill him. We're living a life of ease. We don't feel that now. Uh, sometimes you wish that you could just work in the hearts of your children, for instance. Marianne and I know that. And it's, uh, you wish you could say something. But there's nothing that we can say uh, other than, have you asked God about this? It's got to be the Holy Spirit that works in the heart of other people. And it's got to be the Holy Spirit that works in our hearts to recognize where we have parted from God, what we need to do in our own lives to change so that we can go to God and say, God, I pray for my people. I pray for this church. I pray for families in this church. That's why we have the prayer list. That's why we have the, the new pictures. Uh, it's not just new people. Uh, sometimes if you haven't been here in a while, a person's, they, they look different now. Whether you've been to a, uh, well, not a family reunion. We usually, get, you know, we get, get together more often than that. But you go to a high school reunion or a college reunion or something where you, a group, uh, Shane, I mean, if he got together with a whole bunch of sailors that were on a boat with him or something like that, you know, 30 years from now. But what we had is they gave us a name tag. So name tag doesn't mean a whole lot, you know, 25, 40 years later. 60 years in my case. <laughs> you need their high school picture. So it's, it's important for us, you know, when we get together, and that's why we want to have the, uh, the picture taking. If, you haven't had, if, if you've had any changes, maybe your hair is different or something like that. Uh, we want to have a, a uh, you know, you, you could say it's a, what do we call it? No, it's just, just a book of people that come to church here. And what it is, it's a prayer list. So, and not only that, but when we get to somebody, you know, we, we could say, we, we could actually say their name. And you can find out, you know, what their wife's name is or what their husband's name is or whatever. I mean, those are important things for us to be able to pray for each other. I'll just put a plug in for, I don't know, are you taking pictures today? Yeah? Next week, okay, so put on your best clothes next week if you've got to get your picture taken. All right. So Nehemiah knew who he was praying for. He was praying for his people. We know who, who, who we're supposed to pray for. We need to pray for Pastor Ken. I'm pretty sure he got food poisoning. I won't mention the restaurant because I've been there many times and they had good food. Uh, but uh, he's sick. He's sicker than a dog. And I'm sure that's where 
where Dawn is. She's, she's taking care of him. We need to pray for him. We need to pray for each other because we're supposed to be one body in Christ. We're supposed to be working together. Each one of us has different talents. Uh, I thank God for, for Nick and Ben. Uh, I'm sorry, Ben, but Nick's a better singer. <laughs> and, uh, and Becca, you should turn your microphone up a little bit. So we get the girls part of the singing in there. But we thank God for the different gifts that we have. Some of us are teachers. I thank God for all of us Sunday school teachers downstairs. We don't see them because they're downstairs. But they're there. We thank God for, you know, Teresa and, and uh, Penny and whatnot, that, uh, you know, others that, that teach women's Bible studies. And uh, for the teens, uh, Penny's down there now working with, uh, with teens. Uh, pray for these people. Pray for the deacons. Uh, and it's, because uh, what do the deacons do? Everything that the pastor doesn't have time to do, that's the way it's supposed to be, you know. And you say, what am I supposed to do? You'd be a back of, jack of, uh, uh, expert in all trades, jack of all trades. Yeah, I spent five years in Fort Wayne being a deacon. You know, I've seen how some deacon boards work really well. Some of them could do a lot better. Uh, but leadership is what's important. And if you're a leader in any one of those capacities, guess what you got to do? Look to Nehemiah and other books in the Bible. You'll find out that prayer comes first. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the constant repetition of your desire for us. Lord, sometimes we, we complain about some of the songs we sing that are, that are repetitious. And Lord, uh, a lot of times those, those things ring a bell in our own lives that if we just kept repeating that to ourselves, we wouldn't get into some of the problems that we do. So rather than complain, uh, Lord, help us to be able to see the, the, the purpose and the, and the fruit of uh, you know, repetition uh, in our lives. Uh, if we've ever gone through a, a book before, you know, the pastor wants to, wants to go through, repetition is important. Uh, we can't stop. So, Lord, I, I just pray that you'd uh, be a challenge to each one of us here and... Uh, Lord, I don't want to, you know, every, every head's bowed. I don't, I don't want to see any eyes, you know, look in this direction. Uh, I don't want to see anybody looking around. But, but if, you've, uh, if you've noticed that you, yourself, uh, is in any one of these verses, I, you know, I'd like you to just raise your hand real quickly. And, you know, if you can, if you can see. I saw a couple hands, and, and Lord, I, I just pray that you'd speak to all of us. Uh, we know that all of us are sinners in some way or another. Uh, we don't like to admit it to others. A lot of times we're embarrassed. But sometimes we excuse ourselves. Most of the time we excuse ourselves. But Lord, I pray that you'd just help us in our own quiet time to be able to rec recognize what it is in our lives that is keeping us from being everything that you want us to be. So Lord, I pray for Pastor Ken. I pray that you would uh, heal his body. Uh, you would help Dawn as she uh, helps him get through this problem, uh, temporary problem in his life. So, Lord, we, uh, we give it all to you, and we thank you uh, for working in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.